Hello there. Welcome back to the booth here, Pro Tour Arrivals of Ixalan. That's Simon Gertz and I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. We're happy to have you along as we work our way through modern here, Simon. And we've got two more rounds to go before we call it a day here on day number one. Now, sometimes modern can be on the edges, right? A, a extreme control deck or a slow deck or a combo deck on the other end, maybe a mono red. We're a little bit more in the middle here for our main table. We've got Ivan Flock, and uh, he's playing for Team Ultra Pro with Grixis Shadow, which is maybe one of the most popular decks mm -hmm. going right now. Across from him, Reed Duke. He's playing for Team Ultimate Guard, and he's on Obzon. So we get a chance to see a little bit more in the middle. Why don't we head on down? It's time for the next round of action here from Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan. Hello and welcome back to coverage here at Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Simon Gertzen. And we are ready for round number seven. We've got two players sitting on five and one coming in. So really good start to their Pro Tours. And down in the feature match area, you see Reed Duke from Team Ultimate Guard. He's sitting down with Obzon here is his choice. I'm not surprised to see that. You will often see Reed play a black-green based deck and then maybe with an additional color across the table. That is Yvonne Flock. And uh, he's sitting down with Grixis Shadow, one of the more popular archetypes uh, here in the building. Yes, if you actually sum up all the Grixis Death Shadow builds uh, at this tournament, they are also one of the most played decks here. Okay. It's just if you separate Grixis Shadow from the Traverse Shadow decklist that they appear to be a bit smaller part of the metagame. All right, looks like we're underway here, Simon. Um, big picture speaking here, what, what, what are we looking at for the matchup? What are the key cards interactions? How do, how do we know who's winning? A lot of things are actually very similar. We have um, discards, discard spells in both uh, decks, and we often have Liliana uh, also from both sides, at bo on both sides of the table. But usually the Abzan decks play the full four Liliana of the Veil, whereas Grixis Death Shadow can get away with one or two of them. So th okay. the key is going to be who is going to run the opponent out of resources with uh, whatever basically is necessary. You can see uh, those hand disruption spells that Simon just mentioned a minute ago already in play here for Yvonne Flock before Reed has even had a turn. And you do see a copy of Liliana of the Veil, as Simon also mentioned. Uh, interestingly, Reed Duke going for even more than four copies of three mana Liliana. He's actually got one copy of Liliana the Last Hope in addition to four Liliana of the Veil, a key piece of the puzzle here for Reed Duke. And, and an important decision early on in the game for Yvonne Flock. I, you know, you can see a lot of answers, an Inquisition of Kozilek, a Fatal Push, there's an Abrupt Decay, and then the two more proactive type cards are Dark Confidant and the Liliana. Yeah. So, so basically you almost never take answers in this uh, matchup. What you want is you want to take away a card advantage engine like Dark okay. Confidant and mm -hmm. Liliana of the Veil uh, also counts. Or sometimes you need to protect your hand. And in this case, it can be yeah. correct to take Inquisition of Kozilek or Thoughtseize out of your opponent's if, hand. If he has the answers right. Because he has a, a good idea here that Reed Duke is going to fire off Inquisition on turn one. Ultimately, it was Liliana of the Veil that was chosen. Probably the most outright powerful card out of the mix there. Uh, here goes Inquisition of Kozilek right back at you. So a lot of information for both of these players to process in the early stages to try to map out how the turns are going to go. And uh, also, you know, they get to write down the, uh, their opponent's hand contents, and that's a, a lot of information for them to deal with. Also, as well. great for us on coverage. Yeah, Lots of it's information not bad. for us I don't and know. the viewers. I, I kind of like surprises. I, I want uh, Gitaxian Probe back just for that reason. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. No, so, I'm vetoing that one. So we see a much different look here from Flock. He's got Opt, there's a Death Shadow, a Colagon's Command, a Fatal Push. And then a uh, Thought Scour. Yeah, and, and here, once again, the same thing applies. Uh, the value card is Collagon's Command. The threat is Death Shadow. But, and he, but here, taking the answer is actually interesting for Reed because he wants to follow up with Dark Confident. And if that is not dealt with, then he actually gets the first card advantage of the game. Right, and he can use that to start. You mentioned it can be quite an attish, attrition war. Interestingly, Yvonne Flock really probably interested in drawing lands at this point, did not do so. He found a stubborn denial off the top of the library, decided to cast the opt, and he has not played a second land here, Simon. Yeah, but he did find a fatal push. So 
he will be able to deal with Dark Confident. I expect him to, to fire off the Fatal Push immediately, uh, unless if he doesn't draw a land, he might even feel forced to Thought Scour first. And then uh, he's going to be very happy that Liliana of the Veil vale is not in Reduke's hand, or at least it's unlikely to be in Reduke's yeah. hand. Yeah, rewinding all the way back to that turn one decision that Ivan Flock had to make. Could play dividends here, but here we go. Dark Confidant on the battlefield for Reed Duke. So immediately, Yvon Flock is going to feel pressure here. He needs to deal with this Dark Confidant as soon as he can. He finds land off the top of his library. Yeah, and, and he had a lot of uh, draws to get there together with the Scry on Opt. So this this was not some lucky top deck. He was uh, bound to, to find a second land. And even if he doesn't, this game will go long. And, and if it's attrition, he might actually be better to be drawing a few less lands than, than too many. Yeah. Reed is going to be disappointed that his Dark Confidant didn't even get one trigger. Remember, he did try to set that up by taking away Fatal Push. But as it goes, lots of card selection and quite a bit of time passed in between. So Flach was able to find the answer. Interesting here as well, as Ivan is going to have to manage his life total in a careful way. He wants to be able to start casting Death Shadows when possible. But Reed also has many answers to cards like Death Shadow. You know that uh, Reed will have set up his main deck and perhaps even sideboard for this matchup. And uh, if Yvonne decides to take a whole bunch of damage and can't stick a threat, then Reed can clean up pretty quickly. He uh, often relies on his creature lands down the stretch. We saw uh, Treetop Village in the feature match area a little bit earlier today from Reed Duke doing a lot of work. Yeah, which is, which is very old school. Uh, yep. It's actually surprising that a land that comes into play tapped and only taps for a single mana is still powerful enough to be played in modern. But we have to say, Reed is, I would say knowingly, or maybe knowingly, not playing one of the absolute tier one decks of the format. Yep. He's playing a deck that he's intimately familiar with and that he feels gives him the be best shot at winning. Here's a thought seize now from Flock after he resolved another opt. And the hand looks a little more stripped down here from Reed. It's just two removal spells, no threats, and a couple of lands. It's going to be Abrupt Decay that's going to get chosen here from Flock. And he is, by the way, down to 10. But unfortunately, he doesn't have a second black mana source. So it was either Thoughtseize, which he needed to do to get down to life total, or he's going to have to wait till next turn to start deploying the, uh, the threats. Ooh, a Tarmogoyf off the top of the library for Reed Duke does give him something to apply pressure with, though it may be outclassed by Death Shadow quickly here. Yeah, but it, it can't, be, um, can't be stubborn denial. It's a, it's a very uh, nice threat, of course, to draw here. One of the things that you'll notice about both of these decks, but particularly Yvonne's, is the average converted mana cost of these spells. Incredibly cheap, uh, ranging from free in the case of cards like well, I think he has a Street Wraith in the, in the graveyard now. You know, those type of effects for free to just cycle. And yeah, then it, even it, it depends like a little bit how you count uh, Gurmak Angler and Tassiger. One. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because, <coughs> of course, you will never pay six mana for them. No, he did just draw Tassiger, by the way, Simon, so that's a, a good option for him. Delving can actually be a way to shrink the Tarmogolf as well. True, true. Maybe not with so many cards on, on Reed's side of the battlefield. Yeah, Reed actually has five individual different types of cards. <laughs> so <laughs> he's kind of got that covered on P his pretty side. Pretty impressive. Five yeah. cards, five types. Not bad, not bad. So Ivan probably <laughs> should just keep um, instants and sorceries in his graveyard to maximize his Snapcaster Mages. Of course, that's the big trump card that gives Ivan a bit more value and, and answers in the late game. Although Gurmak, Engler, and Tassiger are also really tough to deal with uh, if you're playing a deck with Abrupt Decays and Fatal Pushes. Okay, so Tassiger, the Golden Fang, on the battlefield. But it is currently outclassed by Tarmogoyf, though Yvonne has been so 19 to 10 sort of religiously uh, leaving up that yeah. stubborn denial mana as well. So first things first, get in there with Tarmogoyf. Five six time uh, of Yeah, it's five six right now, and that is half of Ivan Flock's life total. This is a very quick clock if Reed can get that uh, Tassiger out of the way or even force Ivan to jump with it. Wow, and there's a Dark Confident off the top of the library as well for Reed Duke. So, very good set of turns, and all that Flock can do here is opt. So 
So at the same time, this attack with Tomogoyf uh, grew the Death Shadow in Ivan's hand. Yes. So that is now going to be an 8-8 eight eight mm -hmm. that it Reed is. has to deal with. Otherwise, um, it's just threatening to be a great blocker and potentially even just kill Reed. Because this is not a Death Shadow mirror where both players have to be careful about dam damaging the opponent. Ivan is actually uh, ha has no problems just, just beating down. He's going to lead off with the Death Shadow. And, you know, the plan here for Reed Duke is to leverage Dark Confidant, you know, in Bob we trust. But, of course, Ivan Flock is going to be able to uh, thwart the first removal spell that Reed finds using that Stubborn Denial as a hard counter at this point. And he can only do that because he chose to discard Abrupt Decay over Fatal Push. Mm -hmm. um, where you would think that Abrupt Decay has actually, well, actually, Fatal Push has uh, some upsides, being able to, ca to, to uh, kill four casting cost creatures and only costing one mana, but Abrupt Decay in this matchup is actually the almost strictly better card. Here's the scavenging news, really showing off the pure mid-range <laughs> style that Reed Duke actually prefers in many ways. He's going to start gobbling up cards from the graveyard. Yeah, what can we say? He, he, he is sticking to his guns. I, yeah. I believe that he also picked up Death Shadow for some of the Team Unified Modern uh, tournaments that he played with uh, his teammates. But apparently he just prefers the non-Death Shadow Go. versions. I, um, I would say that's a mistake in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. But if it works for him, it's, it's uh, what he should be playing. Uh-oh. That was Team or Battle Rage off the top of the library. That is the type of card that can uh, end the game in a real hurry. You can and see what it does on the right side of your screen there. It gives, gives a creature double strike, but if the creature's big, it gets trample as well. And uh, as, you, as you might imagine, double strike plus trample on a card like Death Shadow can end the game very, very quickly. And look at, look at what Ivan has been able to do with two mana. He didn't even it's unbelievable. Have, he didn't even have the second land drop immediately. So, so this game has been going on. Reed, is, Reed has five lands in play. Um, maybe, in, well, no, he has a Fatal Push in hand and a land. So that's six lands. Basically, Ivan is up four cards just by not having drawn that many lands. And not needing them. Okay, no blocks. All right, Reed says, I'm taking it. Yeah, and this is... Or this was not supposed to be a lethal attack by, yes. by Ivan. He wants to threaten lethal next turn. When it's, it's, it is close to lethal with the TBR, but it's not quite there. So he's going to settle for eight damage. And he's going to cast another copy of Death Shadow. And as he's done for virtually every turn of this game, he's leaving up that stubborn denial mana. And this is going to be very difficult for Reed to, to get out from under. I mean, he will still be getting a lot of cards from Dark Confidant, so he may be, may be able to just overwhelm oh, Ivan's uh, defenses here, but... With no more creatures to eat for that scavenging news, Reed is going to start gobbling up spells from Flock's graveyard considering uh, the possibility of Snapcaster Mage. Which Flock has in his hand. Now, of course, as long as Scavenging was, uh, stays on the battlefield and Reed has mana available, that um, Snapcaster Mage is not really threatening to flash anything back. Reed is running pretty well by hitting lands, but at the same time, he kind of needs action. He kind of wanted to take damage there yeah. because it would have meant um, an action spell. That Liliana looks promising. If um, Reed has the read on um, Stubborn Denial, which he should. I uh, think he definitely does. Based on what I, uh, Ivan did so far, then uh, he might want to play the Fatal Push into Stubborn Denial. Well, looks like he's just going to lead off with Lilian of the Veil here, Simon. And this is going to force Ivan Flock into a decision. You can see what Stubborn Denial does there. In this situation, it acts as a negate. 
And it looks like that was enough for the game. Yvonne Flock down to five life. Didn't have any other answers. Well, so Get rid of a creature. The reason why he conceded is we, he's, he knew that there was still a fatal push. Mm. In Reed's uh, yes. hand, so he knew that if he stubborn denials, then uh, one of his blockers gets taken out. Yes. And he, um, he dies on, on board. Yes, and if he doesn't, then one of his blockers gets taken out and he dies on board. So no way out there for Yvonne Flock. And it turns out that that mana, you know, him not hitting those lands actually did end up coming back to bite him a bit, even, even though his deck was uh, quite good in the meantime. All right, we've got some updates from our back tables and, of course, more live modern here from Bill Bob. We'll be back with more right after these messages. Looking for a challenge? Magic Online offers monthly limited and constructed events which lead to the yearly Magic Online Championship. Download Magic Online at mtgo.com and start earning the points you need to enter. Celebrate 25 years of magic with Masters 25. Featuring cards from all 25 years of magic's history, Masters 25 is filled with the best of the best. With over 30 pieces of new magic art and a foil card in every booster, make sure to pick up your box on March 16th. And welcome back to the feature match area here in Bilbao, Spain. We're in round number seven, and we're going to do a little live look in. Take a peek over at uh, Lucas Esperbertu. He's playing against Ty Thomason. And let's see what these guys are up to. We see Lucas is up a game as we enter. And you can see there's an old school meddling mage. Chris will be happy with that one. That's Chris Pakula, of course. I know that much. His likeness on the... Yes. <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> on the other side, though, lots of mana for Ty. He's got six mana available, it looks like, after a collected company. But that can't, have been, that can't have been a very good collected company. No. He got, just got a bird of, bird of Paradise out of it. By the way, his deck is called Green White Turbo Lands. What, what in the world is going on over there? It, it does look what like a regular uh, human. No, not human. It does look like a regular um, Connor's company deck, but there's a breeding pool, so it's actually not quite clear what his deck is up to. Yeah, he's got Knight of the Reliquary times four, so he has the ability to kind of search up tool lands from his uh, from his deck. Oh, so does he uh, pair it with Retreat to Coral Helm to go infinite? I don't see it. No, so it's just. But he does play Azusa, Lost but Signal. Yes. So it is, it is kind of turbulent. Ah, I think, I think what he wants to do is he wants to um, run some people out of lands with Ramen Up Excavator and then just uh, play Ghost Quarters, 
to yeah. to punish some of the greedier mana bases. Yeah, Rising canopies in this deck. In this okay, format. I'm into it. This is cool. Now it's not working out super well for him here. He's down to six. This is the the coverage curse. You find a sweet deck and then you cover it, and they oh, collected yeah. company into we're, Birds of Paradise. We're just exposing <laughs> these decks. No, but it, it also seems like this is maybe not the matchup they want to be playing, because humans aggro is not a deck that you just ghost quarter a few times and then you win because no. you have to deal with with these huge threats. Yeah, they also just tend to get that board. Oh, by the way, there's a Romanok, Romanok Excavator there. With Azusa. Let's hang out here for just a minute and see what Ty does. This game feels like it's going to be over one way or the other. This is actually quite the engine if you have um, the ability to play a fetch land from your graveyard multiple times. Yeah. This does knock Ty down to four, though. <coughs> By the way, update-wise, Pascal Vieren, he's playing um, on one of our other side table against Bolung Zhang. He's up a game. And uh, Rivals table has Adriano Moscato against uh, Lim Zhang Yi, and they're going to game number three. Adriano Moscato has been holding it down on the Rivals table. The Rivals table is, if you win, you get to stay. So, and he's been there for, I don't know, three or four rounds in a row now. Yeah, Italian player on Affinity. Mm -hmm. Saw him win some, some tight games. See if he can keep that streak alive. Here's Phantasmal Image to increase the pressure for Lucas. And this one could be over quite quickly. I think it's over it already. It might just uh, be over now. Birds of Paradise is only going to be able to chump lock one of these Mantis Riders. Of course, Phantasmal Image is the other Which one. That might just be it. Uh, well, this one. Lucas also draw. doing tremendously yeah. well, right? Absolutely. Undefeated still? Uh, I went through. Oh, he has a draw. Uh, let me look. Yeah, you're right. They both do, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's going to do it. So uh, that's the handshake, by the way. That's Lucas X River 2 winning his match two games to zero. Improving to uh, 6 0 like and 1. And uh, that means we get to go back to our main match here. Yvonne Flock versus Reed Duke. Looks like it's going back to us. You are correct, Yvonne. Uh, he's been here before. Yeah, also, he's a proto champion. Yeah. He knows the lights of the feature match area well, very well. GP champion, of course, as well. A bunch of um, proto top 16s as well. Sometimes these fall a bit. Uh, under the radar, but Ivan Flog has been one of the best European players on the tour for a very long time. He is awesome. Seriously, yeah. Really, really good player. Go. And it's just land go here for Duke. Flock is going to cycle a Street Wraith and then play Thought Scour, targeting himself, of course. <coughs> And Thoughtscar is actually one of the most powerful turn one plays for this deck mm. because you can cast Gurmak Angler or Tassigar on, on turn two. Yeah, fetch land would set up Gurmag Angler. He could just play a land and cast Tassigar. And, and the Absand deck just doesn't have a good way to deal with six and seven drops. No. You can't Fatal Push them. You, you can't Abrupt Decay them. It's actually too early for Liliana to become relevant. And Somehow you, faster than a three-man. Yeah, it's yeah, crazy. And, and you don't want to pass Threxel in, in an attrition matchup on, on turn two. <laughs> so this has always been my biggest uh, issue with sticking to these non-Death Shadow lists. I think the matchup against the, the Death Shadow midrange um, decks is actually not very good if you if you're facing down one of these big monsters early on. Also, where are the Path Exiles here? Am I missing well, it? He might not play them. I mean, the <laughs> Fatal Push does give you a super good removal spell for for um, a single black. So it's understandable. It's still it's still a tough call. But like I said, I'm, I also find it um, quite interesting that Reed is one of the few players that is sticking to uh, to such a classical build. Classic of, mid range. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's doing very well uh, at five and one, but a anybody else, and I would say, why, why still uh, with this tech when we've had 
Death Shadow be so successful. Uh, yeah, similar style of deck, just compact. <laughs> yeah, I mean, historically, you you always displayed the best finishers you could find. And, of course, Tarmogoyf is one of them. But if you look at Germak Angler, that's basically another Tarmogoyf. Yeah. And I think you're just weakening your deck by, by including cards like Scavenging Ooze or even a Dark Confident that are not as good in a, uh, in a Fatal Push format, which Modern is now. All right. So we mentioned that this is a little bit slow here for Reed, but he did just rip Maelstrom Pulse off the top of the library. And that does give him an answer to the old zombie fish on the other side of the battlefield, though five damage later. Well, yeah, and it has to resolve. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, of course. Very slow. There, there is the dream scenario that Ivan taps out for a second Gurmag Angler. Sure. Then, uh, then you're going to just, Fetch. I don't know, jump up from your table and I mean, do a celebration I, dance. I can tell you, Simon, that Ivan Flock has another Gurmag Angler in hand. Like, this could happen. But, oh. I mean, the, the, the problem with Maelstrom Pulse is even if you know um, <coughs> that Reed has it in his deck, mm -hmm. there's usually one, maybe two copies of it, so it's really difficult to play around it. Yeah, he's got two in his deck. He might get him. Here's a Tarmogoyf on two, though it's not a particularly impressive one. It's four five. Excuse me, it's a three four. Not very impressive. We want our two drops to be five fives. Or five sixes in this case. Be much better. In the meantime, he's just going to have to take five on the chin here. And is, is Yvonne Fluck, does he have another threat to play besides a Gurmog Angler? Or are we going to see it? He's not playing it, passes the turn and back. Also, he doesn't have to. Yeah. You are not forced with this kind of deck to, to be super aggressive. You have a threat in play, and you can play somewhat of a aggro tempo game where you're just saying, I have the five five in play. I have a, I've gotten an attack in. I've been on the play. So you have to show me that uh, you're not just losing yeah. losing this race. Yeah, he needed, additionally, he needed a, a fetch land there or a cycler to be able to get to seven. Sure, that's you know, another, air, that's air another point. Manner. But I'm pretty sure that he still wouldn't have <coughs> cast it. Yeah. Uh, that, that was the, the main mm -hmm. point I was trying to make. So Reed is going to have to just go for the Maelstrom Pulse right now, but it does work. It means, though, that uh, Flock says, well, I'm not going to try to race against Tarmogoyf on an empty board. I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of that. So players exchanging resources in the early stages. And, uh, you know, Flock's down to 13, Reed's down to 14. This could be a close one. Absolutely. The, um, the play that Ivan didn't make there was to use his two untapped mana to just flash in uh, a naked Snapcaster Mage. Mm. A play that sometimes is the right one, but very often not. So it, it's really tricky to evaluate the situations in which you want to do that. The fact that Ivan drew a second Snapcaster Mage right afterwards and that he only has a single blue would have made it appealing. But of course, um, Ivan didn't know what was on, on the top of his library. All right, now here's Lingering Souls for Reed Duke. This is a card that varies greatly by matchup at how effective it is. We've seen it against Affinity be kind of an all-star. How does it match up against Grixis Shadow? Uh, it's a great card, unless there are, there are some tech cards like uh, Liliana, The Last Hope. How about, is it Staticaster? That's pretty brutal. <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about that one, Simon? Okay. Uh, how, does, how does Rita feel about it? He doesn't feel good, but he said, okay, you got it. Wow, oh, yeah, so, <laughs> that so is a this, major is, problem. Um, this is some like, next level sideboarding here. You know that one of the strengths of the Absan deck is Lil, uh, Liliana of the Veil plus Lingering Souls. And yes. this combination of basically managing the life totals, the creatures in play, very, very effectively. And Ivan, of course, knows that Lingering Souls is one of the scariest cards for uh, that Reed can bring an, in against him or that he can have in the main deck. And uh, that's a nice card to have. Is it Steady Castle? Yeah, it also takes care of Dark Confidant quite nicely. It also drew out a Fatal Push, so that's actually an exchange you're very happy with. You got what you, what you wanted, basically. 
Yeah, now Reed kind of forced to do that as he's got the other half of Lingering Soul sitting in his graveyard and we certainly want to get value from that at some point. So that is going to require getting rid of the is it static caster. Also looking at Reed's hand, he does have a copy of Dark Confidant in his hand too. So getting rid of the static caster, a pretty big deal from Duke's perspective. Interestingly though, you know, we know that those cards in the graveyard for Flock don't necessarily have to stay there. There's Snapcaster Mage for the spells, and he's got Colagon's Command for the creatures as well. Mm -hmm. This is a bit scary because you you are running headfirst into Liliana. Liliana. Oh my God, yeah. But you can't always you can't always play around everything. So, Gurmag Angler is so good because it is um, safe from almost all the other removal spells. Reed already played a Maelstrom Pulse. Okay, this was a few turns ago, but he played a Maelstrom Pulse when Liliana of the Veil would have been amazing. Yes. So I think the the percentage of Reed having Liliana of the Veil is low enough that this is a, a really good play. Yep. Here's a Tarmogoyf here for Reed. Go. And he's going to flash back Lingering Souls and pass the turn back here to Evo and Flock. And this removed the last sorcery from all grave. No, there's a Nelson Pulse. Yeah. Take it back. So we still have instant sorcery, land and creature. Yeah. No, no Planeswalker at the moment. Yeah, not quite where Reed wants to be with that Tarmogoyf, just uh, one off. But maybe, maybe he can have enough time with the lingering souls. Let's see what let's see what Flock wants to do this turn. Well, he's going to attack. It's 13, 13, right? yeah. So um, just as Reed says the same thing, it's thirteen thirteen, which means that Ivan cannot yet deploy any death shadows. If Reed starts attacking with Tarmogoyf or just a single uh, lingering souls token, spirit token, then suddenly the Death Shadows are alive. And of course, Reed doesn't know how many Death Shadows even is holding because they are uncastable until now. Yeah, now this fetch land, of course, changes that yeah. equation <coughs> as Flock will now fall down to at least, a, at least 12, maybe 10. And we can start deploying Death Shadows. So we do get to see Yvonne Flock with much more mana here. He's got double the mana than he ended up with in the last one. So okay, yep. there's Death Shadow. It's not huge, just a 3-3. But we know it doesn't usually stay that way for long. And uh, Flock still has that Snapcaster Mage as well. What else does he have in his hand? Let's take a look. Uh, a Dismember is a uh, very potent card. Oh, you can, there you go. You can pay the double black and not take any damage, just take out a Tarmogoyf. But if you want, you can also use it to, to suddenly attack for lethal when, when Reed is least expecting it. Sure. Plummet your life total, but only temporarily. You're not playing against John, so Lightning Bolt is actually not a concern. Reed's deck doesn't really have reach in the sense that it can deal damage to you when it's, when it's not Reed's uh, attack step. Okay, now a scavenging news for Reed. He's only got one green mana available. I shouldn't say that. That's a Twilight Mire, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. he actually has two green mana available. Flock just saying, yeah, you got it. That's a four mana, four, four, gain two life. Yeah. Not bad, but also not exceptional. It does also run into the problem of being uh, easily fatal pushed. Yes. Reed also has a Nile spell bomb in his hand. A little awkward with his mana here. He'd love to be able to leave up that double green to start doing work with the ooze if it becomes relevant. I'll make one black and one green mana. Yeah, so he's just going to go ahead and so use it now. He's got a lot of options here. 
Yeah, and also now th this Trilight Mare is one of the few lands oh, yeah. in Magic that exactly. don't uh, work as, as some other lands because you can't just keep it open and have the same options always. So you have to kind of plan ahead. Yes, and you can see he was doing a little dance there. Of course, Reed is going to be thinking about Colagon's command. He wants to make sure that that Izzet Staticaster is gone for good, but he had to threaten that Marsh Flats with getting another green mana source there. Right. That is all right. And uh, Flock, really not able to react to these, so he just says, okay, you got a Nile Spellbomb, I guess. And N Nile Spellbomb is um, an interesting card. Reed is actually main decking it, but you would think that in a deck with Scavenging Us and Tarmogoyf, it's not always all upside. Yeah. It's just some decks in the format uh, are so graveyard-reliant uh, that it's, it's a good card to have. Flock is going to fire off Dismember here. Man, Adriano Moscato, he really likes the Rivals table. <laughs> he won again, apparently bringing in some pretty sick tech out of the sideboard for his, uh, his affinity deck. He had Bitter Blossom. Yep. Uh, I've seen deck lists with one of those in the mm -hmm. sideboard. Would be interesting to see if he has actually multiple of them. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, and, and like I said, he's on the rivals table. If you win on that table, you get to come back and play the next round, and he has done that multiple times now. Yeah, one bitter blossom in the board, Simon. So he yep. just drew it, and apparently it was very good because it won him the match. You just need one on turn two. Yeah, you can you can tell how difficult this matchup is. Yeah, when you get two really good players like this, kind of slowing Magic their pace one. down yeah, yeah, sure. to make sure. And even this, this is a, something you'll see from Reed. Reed is a he's a worker. You know, uh, he he will have studied deckless uh, and respond. have a good idea of what Ivan Flux Spell running. Bomb you trigger on the stack. Okay. Mentioned that Pascal Viren is playing against uh, Bolin Zhang on one of our side tables as well. That is blue red Pyromancer versus black green mid range. Both of those players sitting at 5 0 and one coming in. They're going to game number three. We will update you with that one. Read with a pretty aggressive line here in response to Thoughtseize, um, cracking Nahal's spell bomb and apparently taking three damage just to be able to draw an additional card. Of course, an artifact in his own graveyard uh, does uh, grow the trauma growth. So here you go, your graveyard's exiled. And Reed shows, well, <laughs> two copies of Dark Confidant, though. Losing one of those at this point, not a disaster. Reed is down to six. Be pretty sketchy to have two of those on the battlefield. Here's yeah. Snapcaster Mage to take the other one as well using Thoughtseize. <laughs> this, of course, is the same turn that Niall Spellbomb was activated, but there but, you go. But this is why I don't quite understand why Reed responded to mm -hmm. the Thoughtseize. Why didn't he let Thoughtseize take it our confident and then um, exile the, the graveyards? Because he could just pay the black and get the card later. Yeah, and, and then it's usually better to no show your opponent only one card and then have a random card because even would have taken the better one of the two. Mm -hmm. So kind of um, kind of a weird interaction there. Yeah, this is five, six, right? Right. Okay, so I'll this two. All right, and you saw Reed snapped off the, yeah. the block, the triple block there to make sure that the uh, Death Shadow was dead, but he does lose Tarmogoyf and one of his spirits, and you can see this is good news for Yvonne Flock because he still has the 5-5 five, five Gurmog Angler ready to attack. Go. And it's just a land off the top for Reed Duke, so he is on the ropes here, officially speaking, down to six. A removal spell would end it? No, there is a creature land there, a yeah. Shambling Vent. The shambling Vent should keep him alive for at least one more turn, yeah. but how do you draw out of this now that there are, uh, there's also a Snapcaster on the, on the battlefield? It's a lot of a lot of the cards that would save you uh, are actually not effective anymore. Well, Liliana of the Veil vale is is one good example. That's where you might think Snapcaster Mage. Okay, a two one is actually not that relevant. But when uh, when the edict ability on Liliana suddenly doesn't work anymore, 
or it doesn't work as intended anymore. Ooh, what did Reed find? An attack for two. Okay, attack for two. That does put Flock down to four and Reed just out of range of the two creatures that Flock has. Reed's going to go up to eight. I know it looks weird, right? He's so far behind. I think, you know, a lot of people would think, oh, okay, I better leave this thing back to Block. But uh, as it stands, Flock has now put out lethal five, six, seven, eight, nine. And all he has to do is turn them sideways. And we're going to go to game number three here. Good stuff from both of our players having to work their way through a pretty complicated mid-range matchup. And uh, eventually, Yvonne Flock, with no mana issues that game, found his way to the victory. Let's take a look at that table. You can actually see it going on behind Yvonne there. That's Bolong Zhang from the United States. He's playing against Pascal Vieren from Belgium. <clears throat> and they are in, looks like the early stages of game number three. And just as we enter the game, there's an inquisition of Kozilek and uh, Bolun tapped on the cryptic command, which is of course not a legal play, so. Yeah. That's, that's a little awkward. Pascal's on blue-red Pyromancer, but it looks like the judge may be having a little chat here with Boling Zhang because it's, it's common to get a warning for that, Simon, if you, uh, you know, don't resolve the spell in the way that it is able to be resolved, it will sometimes uh, result in a warning. May have here as well. In the meantime, there still is a decision to be made for Bolong Zhang. Can't take the Cryptic Command, so... He, he has taken the Spell Snare. He's going to no. take Spell Snare. And play a land and pass the turn back to Pascal. It looks like a snow-covered island. I played those in my Storm deck. Two gifts I'm given for. Which never happens, but you put it in there anyway. <laughs> you get to feel clever when you tell people while they're in there. So what is Pascal up to here? Ancestral Vision, Cryptic Command, Logic Knot, Mana Leak, Opt, Remand Serum Vision, Snapcaster, Spell Snare, Thing in the Ice, a Braid Bolt, Roast, Pyromancer, and Electrolyze. So this is like blue, a blue-red control deck. Uh, it it yes. shares a lot of cards with blue-white control or, or Jeskai control, but instead of f going the full control route with a lot of mass removal, you're playing three Thing in the Ice and three Young Pyromancer which are um, quite threatening for a lot of decks in the format. And especially, I think that uh, could be a very smart choice if you're expecting a lot of humans decks, for example. Yeah. Which, by the way, I think was a safe expectation coming in. I heard some uh, estimates from players yesterday. Now, this is, of course, before they had any, any actual knowledge of the metagame. Estimating up to 20% is what some of the teams were considering to be human stacks coming in, so. Yeah, it turned out to be um, closer to 10%, mm. but still, if you prepared for humans, you were probably also preparing for aggro um, to be popular, and that definitely was the case with um, burn and affinity putting up strong numbers as well. So what Pascal did is he lightning bolted the Tarmogoyf and then targeted himself <coughs> with his Relic of Progenitus to reduce the Tarmogoyf's toughness one fewer. And Pascal says, now it dies. Because because the Inquisition of Kozilek is exiled. Yeah. So that actually... The sorcery being gone. The sorcery, no, the sorcery was already gone. Okay. And then Pascal made it so that in his, in his grave here, there was only a lands and instance left. Yeah. And that is enough to get the Tarmogoyf dead. Here is a scavenging news. I, I want to see a little bit more of this deck from Pascal. It looks like he's going to logic knot. You mentioned that this is a place like a control deck. And then he has these kind of engine cards with the thing in the ice and the young pyromancers in the middle to late part of the game that can just take over. And Pascal is handling... Wow, he's just got all the answers yeah, here. Yeah, he's handling everything that, that Bullwin is playing. Yeah.
It's not easy to dismantle these uh, black-green value no. decks. No, they can be very difficult with all the hand disruption. And there we go. Ancestral Vision. Now, he's not doing anything cute with it. He's just suspending it and drawing cards later in the game. But four suspend counters, and uh, this could be a major issue for Bo Lung Zhang. Although, he keeps coming with the threats. Jeez. Dark Confidant and Tarmogoy follow-up plays. Yeah, it looks like Pascal's going to go ahead and just activate. Is he going to actually use... He's thinking about it. Uh, but he has a Cryptic Command. I think he wants to really cast that um, to draw, uh, to, to buy some more time. Okay. And what, he, what he's really looking for is another Electrolyze. Electrolyze, 1-1, one, one, and then after, uh, after the Electrolyze ha has resolved, you sacrifice the Relic to kill. To and kill there's the a moment with. where Goyf has a damage on it in one toughness. Yeah, that's, that is a beating. I believe he drew a remand for the turn to go along with that Cryptic Command, so he can certainly keep himself alive for a while at 18 life. But the, but the Cryptic Command doesn't really do that much. The, the scariest no. effect here is actually the, the Dark Confident trigger. Absolutely. And look at this. This is how it goes. Thoughtseize goes into the hand of Bolin Chong. And he gets to draw his card for the turn as well. Oh, oh, I missed this one. All right, well, we'll let these guys figure out what they're going to do and head back up to our main table. Yvon Flock versus Reed Duke. As this one's probably going to take a little bit of a while to come to a conclusion. Yeah, we don't want to miss anything here. Yeah, if you draw fetch land. Yeah. Something. I guess like at five? Yeah, five fetch lands, like go to two. Lots of respect between these two players. Yeah, you know, and, and I have to say they're, they're, they're similar players. They're both methodical. They're both really nice. Just humans, like you talk to them. and It's true. Now that they're you both say respectful. It. Yeah. So the question then, of course, is, is Reed the American even flock or is even flock the European Reed Duke? As always, we'll leave that to chat to decide. All right, fetch, 19. But uh, they do have a lot of similarities in their play style and personalities. Yeah, except that Ivan wow. uh, switched to the dark side and, and put Death Shadows in his deck. Yeah, that's true. Man, I wonder how... <laughs> look at, take a look at that swamp. That thing has seen some days, <laughs> I'll tell you that. That swamp looked like it got played before sleeves were <laughs> required. All right, so here it is, Inquisition of Kozilek for Reed Duke. And what do we got? Um, well, Odd Scour, Snapcaster stands out. There's also... Well, there's two of those and a Death Shadow as e well as Even with his, with his favorite uh, one land hand. Mm -hmm. We've yep. seen he only needs two, so. That's true. No, but of course, uh, with Thought Scour and yep. Opt. Oh, look at this. He's going to take Opt. Yeah. Perhaps it's trying to strand Yvonne with not enough mana this game. It is probably the most powerful spell in, in Yvonne's hand, given that he only had this one, one mana. And. I've touched upon the fact that this is not such an easy matchup for, for Reed. The chance of just having even stumble on mana once again could be the yep. best way to, to just win the game, or at least the easiest way. Okay, so Thought Scour, not, not quite as powerful as Opt as far as uh, finding lands goes, and he in fact does not. Uh-oh, well, okay. <laughs> There's always hope. He's going to cycle a Street Wraith. Now, is this a land for him? Street Wraith is another reason why you can keep a lot of hands. Yeah. Your, your deck is actually smaller. Um. No. That was the third copy of Snapcaster Mage going into hand for Flock. And wow, that play from Duke taking away the Opt is really paying dividends as Flock, even though he's seen quite a few cards since then, has not been able to find anything. And now Reed gets to start kind of turboing through the game thanks to Dark Confidant. Yeah, and, and Reed is on his way to just bury um, Ivan in card advantage. A Grim Flayer, a second Dark Confident, a Liliana. All of these cards are terrible to face when you have a land and a, and a spell bomb yeah. on the battlefield. Yeah, this next draw step is going to be absolutely critical for Flock. Finding a land this turn. The window's going to close quickly. Oh, he doesn't find it either. It's another Thought Scour. Again, there's always hope. But it's, th this best case scenario for him is that he can just hit his land drop for the turn at all. Two non-lands, and he hit one. He hasn't even oh. milled a land, so, so he's, 
Yeah. The top of his deck has just been without lands. Yes. And he has been trying his hardest to hit this land drop. And, and this might have been the last opportunity he had realistically to hit it and still stay in this game. So hang in there, Ivan. We might still have a game for you. But his but hand is... Reed is going to pounce here. Exactly. I mean. It's it's also lacking the early interaction. So maybe maybe he shouldn't have kept the hand. It's difficult against uh, against the Thoughtseize deck to, to take uh, aggressive mulligans. But Death Shadow was... Effectively uncastable. Snapcaster Mage in a, in a one land hand is pretty weak. Yep. And Nihal's Spellbomb doesn't yes. stop a lot so of the aggression. Right, it was with a single, oh, yeah, with yeah. A single yeah. Fatal Push, yeah. it's a different yeah. story. Okay. Okay, and then I drew. Reed has a lot of firepower in that hand. Look at that, Liliana of the Veil, Dark Confidant, Thoughtseize, Lingering Souls, Maelstrom Pulse. Yeah, and it's, the, the best thing is that it's not all reactive. He can also just deploy threats, and Liliana is certainly a big threat on this board. Now well. this is a Grim Flare hitting as well, which of course means Reed now will have the opportunity to order, you know, he can mess around at the top of his library to set up future draw steps. Let's not forget Dark Confidant in there as well. He can make sure that he hits uh, Delirium. I mean, is it too late? Like, is Yvonne Flock just already out of this game? I think it's very close to over, yes. <laughs> the, the cards that can get him back here is Spot Removal for Grim Flayer, and maybe some, some Miracle um, is it Static Caster for <laughs> uh, Dark Confident. But Reed doesn't make a mistake here. He doesn't play a second Dark Confident. He, did, he has no reason to give Yvonne these kind of outs. All your lands damage here as well. That's the other thing, of course, is that Yvonne Flock's deck is in some ways designed to lower his life total. And uh, when he's under immense pressure like this, even those small, small things can add up, the mm -hmm. fetch lands, that kind of stuff. And uh, good guy, Ritu, of course, helping him with that. With that life total reduction? Nine, yeah. <laughs> Reed's very helpful when it comes to reducing opponent's life totals to zero. Yes. So Ivan Flock went and got a swamp so that he could crack that Nile spell bomb and pay for that optional ability. But he is so far behind now and facing legit pressure. Flock down to nine life. And he just has to assume that anything he puts out to block is gonna get killed by Liliana or removal spells at this point. Yeah, and that's not, not too difficult to predict when there's a Liliana with four. Right, uh, she's loyalty. on the battlefield plus any number of removal. In in this case it's a maelstrom pulse from Duke means that Blocking is just going to be so difficult for Flock this game. So what you have to do here is you have to um, probably Fatal Push the Grimfire just to not take too much damage. Mm -hmm. And then you have to draw something to deal with the remaining threats, which are all one toughness creatures. So there are ways to do that. Um, then Liliana is probably threatening to ultimate. So yes. th there are uh, quite a few hurdles to take. Okay, Ivan is going for the even more aggressive line. He's saying, I can't beat uh, you drawing two cards at each turn, so I'm going to take care of Dark Confident and accept that that just means more damage for me. Yeah, oh, actually, oh no. Uh, Go he, ahead. Um, he emptied Reed's graveyard earlier, so uh, even though Reed had Delirium at some point, he lost it again. So, oh, so sure. the Grim Flare is actually just just worse than the Dark Confident. Well, you know, we know that Grim Flare doesn't take long to get Delirium going again. Attack for two. Two damage. Seven. Yeah. Top three. Yeah. Also, there's a little subtlety that you hear as well. You, you heard Reed announce attack for two. That yeah. was him recognizing and acknowledging that his Grim Flare was no longer a 4-4. Four, four and in communicating kind of a respectful it. And communicating way. it yeah. uh, very clearly. Yeah. yeah. Reed, I think, is um, just a very good example uh, of... In my mind, he's the very gold clear, standard. Yeah, very for, clear. For, you know, he announces everything. He makes sure to clear what he's targeting. There, it's just so rare that you see one of those situations where it's ambiguous and you're like, wait, what did... What, I thought you meant that. No, you just know with him. So 
So he's going to thought seize away one of the death shadows and play lingering souls. And your turn. Did he decline to use Liliana this turn? Exactly. He knows that there are three Snapcaster mages in Evan's hand, uh, which are effectively dead cards. So he doesn't see a benefit to plusing Liliana. Going from four to five is not a huge difference if you're expecting to, to minus two her anyway. So that's a completely reasonable play to protect your own uh, cards in hand. And that's something... Actually, I think which a lot of players don't do uh, often yeah. enough, just not okay. active, really, yeah. And that is going to do it, Simon. While we were chatting, Yvonne Flock said, I've had enough. Reed yeah, Duke, well, you got first, me. First game, it was still completely my mistake. Good games, though. Good games. Interesting, you know, the players, I heard them I talking about in, that in concession the from the first oh, game. I played poorly. <laughs> no, uh, I think, I think uh, <laughs> what Yvonne I meant is... Well, let's listen to him. So many yeah. decisions as you yeah, but still, like, considering when I, like, I can kill you next turn. Probably. Yeah, oh. he was talking about that concession, but um, it looks like we're going to pop back over. I, I love to hear what the players say after the match, especially two players like this. But, but did, he, did he concede when it wasn't lethal? I, th I thought that's, he is what, that's what he insinuated, though, you know, w Seven? life goes on in the booth here, so I wasn't able to, like, go back and, and really think it through. But that, that is the, that's what I got from their conversation from earlier. And he wasn't happy about it. No, but we, we will get the chance to catch up with them. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, if we, Yvonne, if why we did find you out concede when it wasn't, you know? Oh, that's the best, <laughs> best questions to ask when you're on coverage. Oh, man. I heard you were very upset about this. <laughs> <laughs> this mistake you made. Can you explain it to me? So what we have here, by the way, is turns. We're in extra turns down on this match. This is turn two of five, as you can see on the graphic. With both players of seven life, both players are 5 on 0 and 1, and both players with one game apiece. Two. But uh, you got to like Pascal Vieira inside of the, of the field here with Awoken Horror crashing into the red zone and uh, dropping Bolong Zhang down to 7, and now Bolong just he needs to find answers. I'm very intrigued by this blue red deck. Very intrigued. I'm curious too now. In, in this meta game, the card choices, every card is playable or even like really good in modern. And somehow it's not on the metagame radar. I, right. I want to try this out. I'm curious nice. now, too. You know, I, it was funny when I read the list a little a few minutes ago. I was kind of waiting for the aha moment. Yeah, where the punch, like, oh. like the through the breach or something. Yeah, the through the breach or the as foretold or just some, you know, like, oh, I see what you're doing here. And it's like, no, these are all just kind of good cards. <laughs> all right. So was that fatal push? No, it looks like Liliana with the veil. So thing in the ice. Slash Awoken Horror in the graveyard now. And now we're right back to even. Whoa, that is a stacked hand for Bo Lung Zhang. He's going to kick things off by discarding a Liliana to his own Liliana and then playing a Tarmogoyf. But wait, there's more. Another Tarmogoyf here that's for a, Zhang. That's and he a just huge says, swing. Do you got it? <laughs> that's going to do it. Bo Lung Zhang is now 6-0-1. And Pascal Vieren. Uh, sorry, that was that. That looks like we were. Uh, that wasn't turn three. That uh. was turn five. And in fact, <laughs> it's a little bit awkward here, Simon. I'm not going to lie. The second draw. Yeah, uh, they're both five zero oh, and two, with one more round to go here on day one. That is not a record you see very often. I five. Oh, I have two. to. I have to say something here. You don't want your first draw at the Pro Tour, but you certainly don't want your second draw on day one of the Pro Tour. Okay. It's just like a loss. It doesn't get you closer to making day two. Of course, these players have their wins already, but still, you're um, basically just boycotting your chances of making top eight. Yeah, that's a tough one. 5-0-2 for those two gentlemen. Technically undefeated. I guess they have that going for them. All right, we're going to take a short break from here. Then we'll be at the news desk, and when we come back, we'll have one more round of Modern here from Bilbao. Don't go anywhere.
Magic is a game of great joy. Uh, I know that many of you watch because it is an escape in some ways from the real world. And we like to bring you all the joy and excitement and drama of every twist and turn. And we want you to care about every turn of the card as much as we care about every turn of the card. Sometimes though, uh, the real world does impinge on our joy and our excitement and our drama. And unfortunately, that's been the case uh, today. Uh, there's no uh, easy way um, to say that, unfortunately, we have heard today um, that one of our own, Corey McDuffie, um, at 25, um, has been taken from us. Um, Corey was a terrific Magic player and played many other TCG players. Uh, I guess his pinnacle as a Magic player was a Grand Prix Top 8 when he was only 18 in 2011 uh, at Dallas Fort Worth. But he played a lot of times on the Pro Tour, made many, many friends. Friends. Now, of course, this is a global broadcast and many of you won't have had the chance to meet him. But Magic is a game that attracts the young and the vibrant and the smart and the passionate and the talented. So it's all the harder when someone who is young and vibrant and smart and passionate and talented isn't around anymore. So on behalf of everyone in the Magic Pro community and indeed for all of us around the world, we just wanted to take a moment to honour and remember Corey McDuffie, gone at 25. But magic, of course, goes on. So, um, as I'm sure Corey would want, um, it's time to find out more about the game we all love. It's deck tech time. Once again, here's Paul Cheon. <laughs> 